Thank you very much, Meg. And now we've Jane Souter again, who you well know from our academic and legal team. Uh, hi, everybody. So, um, some of what I'm talking about is a little bit of what Meg has said and um, a little bit from Murs and that kind of thing, and then just trying to put it into um, a, a context where we can look and see what, what other countries besides, um, besides Westminster do. So, you know, you've all heard plenty of times now that um, our model is a Westminster model copied directly from the, from the houses of Westminster. But of course, we also do have a very different sort of situation. So there's the, the size that Meg referred to there, but also the fact that we have a, a different electoral system means we have more parties um, that, are, that are in there and, and so on. But I think one of the, the crucial things is that a, a Westminster system sets up this government versus opposition uh, dynamic. Um, we still very much um, have that. And you can see it here, even the, the structure of the building. So you have government sit on one side, opposition on the other, and you have the, the kind of thing that we see on TV or that you would uh, have, have got from various shows about you know the, the quick wit and the, the shouting abuse and the, the government voting one way and opposition the other is the kind of the, the caricature. Now, as, as Meg has said, that has loosened a good deal in the, the UK recently. But because of the, the sort of the strength, the sort of three-line whip, which I'll talk a little bit about later, you know, we still have very much it's government or opposition, and there's no sense of trying to reach uh, consensus votes, which would be much more the norm in, in Europe. And plenty of votes in in Germany and in Denmark and in other places, you'd have 80 or 90 percent of the parliament could vote in favour um, of a bill if if that was what what they agreed with. Um, so. Just even the just a quick thing here. Which way is it going? To nowhere. Why doesn't this work? Okay, there. So th that was just to show you two different parliaments. There's a Dutch and the German parliament there. So you can see even how the, the sort of the seizing arrangement makes a difference to the kind of the, the culture and to the collegiality and to the amount of consensus building. And I know I've been struck here by the amount of um, TDs who've said to me that they actually really enjoy being here. And one of the reasons is that they can sit down and talk in a nonpartisan way about kind of policy, that they don't have to be necessarily um, the, the opposite to somebody because they happen to be government or opposition. So it's just a thing to, to think about in terms of, you know, the way our culture kind of requires us to do that. And actually in some one of the, I think it's, is it the Bundesrat, Meg? Um, where they actually sit by region rather than by uh, party and often actually vote by region rather than by party. So it's not always um, party controlled. But uh, we know here that we have a very strong um, party control system. Um, the, the party leader, I think crucially the thing is that he controls um, all members' future careers. So if you want to be the, the leader of a, of a committee, you want to be a junior minister, you want to be a cabinet minister, then you don't want to step out of line because there's, there's no other way to power. The, the Taoiseach controls, or the Tónishta for his party, controls your future, controls um, whether or not your, how your career is, is going to go. Um, and you've seen that even um, recently, we've seen that they can, the, the Taoiseach can remove people from committees as well if, he'd, if he doesn't like what, what the way they've been voting. And, uh, and so on. So we have very, very strong parties and the, the, the Taoiseach has very strong controls over um, independent TD, over all his uh, TDs. But I think the other crucial thing to think about in this as well is actually the, to, to what extent is it, you know, this whole argument has been set up as one of the, the executive versus the, uh, the, the, the legislative, so the, the, the control and power that the cabinet have over uh, backbenchers and over the running of the door. Um, but I think in one way, there's actually a hidden power behind that, and that's actually the power of the bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting to think about the extent of uh, bureaucratic capture, capture of the executive. You know, if you look at this government, for example, when they went in, there was a lot of reforms which were going to happen 
which didn't. You know, some people would talk privately about there was a, a window of a few weeks, a few, some would go to a few months, where ministers still very much had their own ideas before the policies that the bureaucracy had in the last government um, re reasserted themselves. And of course, it's in the civil servants' interests, one of their jobs is, if you think about it, to maintain the status quo, okay? The civil service doesn't want big change. The civil service doesn't want a lessening of executive power. They want to be able to deal with one minister, not a rabble of backbenchers. They, you know, most civil servants I've met don't particularly enjoy going before, um, before door committees. They like that central, um, they like that central control. So you need to think about, well, you know, what happens here? We, like, we have a big media thing against advisors, for instance. But ministers go in there, they're not policy experts. They meet civil servants who've been in there for, um, for years, who have a certain agenda, and they don't necessarily have uh, the resources to be able to, to tackle that themselves. So there is a certain amount of bureaucratic capture. Just look at a couple of examples. One that we had here, like I don't know if you remember the letter that was supposedly came from um, Minister Phil Hogan. Um, I don't know if anybody imagines that Phil Hogan wrote that letter or was it uh, civil servants in the Department of the, of the Environment. So, you know, there can be very strong agendas coming through. Or if you look at FOI, which of course is the one thing that... Um, was in the programme for government, so the parties, when they were in opposition, were in favour of strong FOI, and yet we had, at a very late stage of a committee, after it had been considered, um, uh, the Minister for Reform coming in with changes that would actually make FOI much more expensive and much more difficult. You know, I would imagine that that was clearly a civil service priority. It wasn't a government priority to nobble FOI. It was a civil service priority. Um, so a lot of these things kind of come through. So I think you need to think as well about ways of even empowering parties to, to be able to, to deal with the, the, the civil service. Um, if we look here, this is just a table which is kind of done the rounds. It comes from um, Neve Hardiman. Um, so it just shows the kind of the dominance of uh, the government over parliament. And you see ourselves, the UK. The UK, I imagine, with the, the recent reforms that Meg has been involved with, would be dropping down from, from there now if, the, if this study were redone. But it's ourselves and the Greeks which have uh, the most dominant executives. So I think maybe that tells its, uh, its own story about, uh, you know, how much we really want a very dominant uh, um, executive. Um, so to come on to some of the other things, on the, the left there we have a, a picture of our current Kian Corla. Um, his job is obviously to maintain order in the House, uh, allow members to take part in de debate, make sure business is conducted in, in an efficient manner. Um, but even he has said that the, the office is badly in need of modernisation. So I think the kind of thing that Meg was talking about there that's happened in the, the British Parliament about the, um, you know, a secret election for the Kian Corla, that he would be somebody that's elected by the members and not chosen again as a favoured patronage appointment. And again, often one that actually has as much to do with constituency as it does with, with personality or it has done on occasion in the past because, of course, the Kian Corla gets returned gets re returned uh, without election at the, at the next bill. And the other picture, the, the rather gruesome one there on the, the right, is a, is a picture of a, of a guillotine. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some uh, numbers now that compare our use of the, the guillotine with those in um, other countries. But essentially, there's five stages of, of any bill. And I'm not going to spend ages going through them, but there's three um, that really matter. Um, but what happens is you can introduce amendments like the ones at the, the FOI at a very late stage, um, even at the, the committee stage, and then you can just say, okay, there's no more debate. And the, it just gets, as, as, as I think Fintan O'Toole called it, sort of rammed through. So if you think about the property tax bill, I think the first property tax bill was put through the doll in um, a total of two hours. There were 88 amendments, and only three of those amendments were actually discussed. So that's what the, the guillotine does. So in some ways, some people might say, well, it's efficient, and we can get much more laws passed. But it 
completely adds to executive dominance, as you might imagine, but it also adds to the likelihood of poor legislation getting passed because if things aren't scrutinised properly, the chances of something getting through that is going to cause later problems increases dramatically. Um, so the government has said that it's going to, um, it's got targeting a 20% reduction in the use of the guillotine. But, uh, you know, it's still used an awful lot. And even if that were to be achieved, I'd argue that it's still overly used. Um, so if we look here at um, this is a table which shows the, how curtailed debate can be. And uh, basically the, the majority, so the, the um, France, Greece, again, Ireland and the UK were the countries that, uh, that use the guillotine um, to a great extent. Okay, the ones that don't are not allowed to use it at all are Finland, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Now, people argue if you can't use it at all, then business can go on for a long time. It can be very inefficient. So you'll see most countries have actually chosen a sort of a middle ground. So you've got everybody from Belgium, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland have a kind of uh, a middle ground where it must be agreed in advance between all the parties that a guillotine is okay. So it can't just be put through by, uh, by government parties. So that's the norm in Europe, is that uh, a guillotine would be a cross-party agreement rather than just um, a, a government decision. Uh, this table here, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, the first column here, there's an S and an O, and it tells you where has open votes for electing the Kian Korla and where has secret votes. Now, obviously, if you have an open vote, uh, it sounds good, doesn't it, an open vote? But, of course, it means that everybody can see the way that you voted and, therefore, your vote can be controlled. So a secret vote allows people to vote for who they actually really want. Now, of course, this doesn't always happen. In some places, you have to show your vote to the whip on the way through, even when it's a, a secret vote. And, you know, so it's not, a, it's not an ideal kind of scenario, but, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> it protects you uh, to, to some extent. And the other kind of things that people look at is, look, can the, can the Kian Korla um, summon a plenary session? Um, and in most countries, the Kian Korla can say, OK, we're going to have a plenary session about a debate or about something that we want, but not here, um, the UK or, or, or Switzerland, but almost everywhere else. Um, and can the Kian Korla or the leader, can they set the agenda of parliament? Uh, not in Ireland, France, Germany, Spain and Sweden. Sweden. It's less common than the other, but still in, in many countries, the leader of the house can actually, can actually set that. So in some places there are, you know, quite sort of wide ranging uh, jobs that um, the, the leader of the house can do. Um, so here, I just have a, a little picture there of, uh, you might recognise some of the members of, uh, of a committee uh, in action. And, you know, as Meg said, our committees, we've seen them more in newspapers in the, in the last six months than in the past. You know, they, they are doing more and so on. Um, somebody gave me the answer to Meg's question earlier, so I think I might uh, just share it with you. The last time our subcommittee on dole reform sat, uh, Pat Carey from Fianna Fáil was the chair, so uh, it was uh, it was quite some time ago. Angus is saying no. No, oh, right, okay. Well, I was told earlier that that wasn't the case, so there you go. Um, but anyway, that committee or a reconstituted version of it could be one that you're talking about. But I think one of the big problems we have to think about here is actually our culture. So if you talk to a lot of TDs, and I'm sure some of the ones here, at least privately, they'll tell you that there's no votes in committee work, unless you happen to be on one of the big ones that's, you know, in the newspapers doing a lot. So, you know, what do we actually demand of our TDs? We're not asking them to do committee work. We're not demanding it of them. We want them to be on call for our medical cards or our passport ap applications or, you know, whatever else is the case. So, you know, there is a cultural thing here as well. It's not just about rules. So we need to think of ways of actually incentivizing, of want getting TDs to actually want to do more work in committees. Um, you know, a lot of uh, TDs, that I'm sure everybody here is an exception, but they think of their main job uh, is actually to get re-elected. 
So what, that's what they, they would spend a, a lot of their time on. So if your main job is to get re-elected and then there's no, there's no votes in committees, what are you going to do? Okay, so like I've stood in, in, in front of committees as other people have and there's some, you know, very diligent people and you see great examples on YouTube, people asking great questions, really examining and so on. But then there's plenty where people wander in and out and they sit there texting or tweeting and make statements and then wander out again. So, you know, there needs to be um, a kind of a cultural thing where we actually care what happens at, at, at committees. Um, was there something else? Oh, I think a really big thing about uh, committees is their resources. So they have very few resources uh, compared with other ones. Very few administrative resources and effectively no legal resources. So the government has a trump card. The government can always turn around and say, well, we have the advice of the Attorney General. And so whenever they say that, that's their trump card. They put it down. They may or may not, usually not, publish the advice of the Attorney General, but the TDs actually have no recourse to their own legal advice. So, no, not proper ones. You ask Leah, who is here, and if anybody is asked about, if somebody talked to her about what can you have, um, and I have to thank Charlie Flanagan for uh, some of the suggestion of this, but Leah also suggested it. If she was asked about the constitutionality of a bill, she wasn't allowed to answer that as the legal advisor in the door, and the government would say no. So to give the, the backbenchers access to uh, legal advice where the advisor can actually talk about the constitutionality or otherwise of a bill would dramatically increase the, the, the power of the, of the committees. And the other thing that would make a difference is uh, if you look at the, the power in terms of when you look at it, we saw our budget was in front of the Bundestag before it was in front of the Dáil. So rather than saying it should be later to the Bundestag, shouldn't we be saying it should be earlier to, to the Dáil? To actually have more, it's beginning to move a little bit in this direction, but examining current expenditure more in current time in advance of it being spent rather than um, always examining things afterwards. Or in Denmark, for example, the committees are very powerful and the ministers have to come in before they go to Europe and talk about exactly what it is that they're, they're going to talk about there. Or the other suggestion is, for example, in the European Parliament, uh, they have two weeks of um, plenaries, a week of committees, and then a week of party business. So that means the committee and the plenary business never clash, never overlap. Whereas in our chamber, the committee and plenary business can clash and overlap all of the time. So to separate those as well would Sorry, incentivize Jane, you, people to spend more time in committees. Could you, would you mind? Oh, okay. Yeah. And the last yeah. thing is on the, is on the whip. So these are the things. Do you want to consider electing the Kian Kola, allowing them to take more control of the Dáil agenda, electing chairs, relaxing whips, not having a three-line whip all the time, increasing admin and policy support, uh, giving committees and backbenchers their own constitutional legal advisor and more independent policy advice in general. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.